All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So you guys are still thinking about the Miami game. <laughs> Amazing game. I'm, I'm so annoyed with seeing all the news, but they need to understand 26 seconds is still needed to score. <laughs> we scored. So with that, getting out of my tummy because I've been thinking a lot about that game. Uh, we're going to get started for the Ziegler lecture. Uh, just to this, uh, Ziegler lecture was uh, established in 1999. And I want to thank the Ziegler family uh, for supporting this uh, series. It's really to support our outstanding faculty member in this and for great meeting we are doing. Um, we have had discussions in school whether it's outstanding uh, for the time period they're here or it's a lifetime achievement award. And I think it looks like a lifetime achievement award for people such as Rahu who has been here for almost 23 years. Uh, we were just talking about he moved to Georgia Tech in 2000. Uh, he did his uh, uh, undergrad in India. And master's PhD also in there. His PhD was from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Then he did a couple of postdocs and ended up working with uh, Suresh, who was another outstanding Ziegler awardee himself. So it's like something he touched there, which probably excited him to teach amazing classes here. 1670 to different courses he have taught in CAD CAM, looking at the you know FEA and others. I'll just say the amount of students he had touched when I was reading through the packet, uh, which uh, Craig shared the committee under the Ziegler awarding. Uh, the, the student support you have in your letters was outstanding. Uh, you can hear the dedication and support student feel from his classes that they were all writing long letters. I was reading the letters and I was like, okay, this person must have touched so many different lives here. And this is really not an outstanding achievement for teaching, but outstanding achievement for transforming our student through the engagement we have. And all of you, what you're doing in the classes are really engaging with our student and putting them on the path for success and transforming their life. That's what we're doing here. And I'm really excited to have the lecture from the group. We're going to do an event right after that for food. So I'm going to tell everyone who is also online, you're going to miss amazing food. <laughs> if you were there in person, you would see a lot of uh, good food. With that, Raghu, the floor is all yours. Let's join in congratulating him. This is how it's going to show, I guess. Yeah, we switch the display to this place up top. Up on top. Oh, yeah. Up on this place. Yeah. There you go. That's cool. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I will first want to thank the committee for choosing me for this award. Um, I think I, I came in 2000, as uh, David just told me, I, first time I attended this lecture in 2001, and it was the winner that time was uh, Dr. Farooq Mistry. I remember attending his lecture, uh, his talk, I mean. After 22 years, uh, happy to receive this award. Uh, it was nice to, nice to receive this award and join the list of uh, distinguished faculty who got this award. In the, Last 20 years or so. So today um, I'll be talking about scholarship of teaching and learning framework for evidence-based teaching practices I've been using the last 18 years or so um, in my courses. I'll briefly talk about some terminology related to pedagogical aspects in this audio. Then I'll present some of the evidence-based uh, teaching practices I use in my classroom, some ongoing efforts and effects and summary. The scholarship of teaching learning involves instructor undertaking a systematic inquiry about student learning. Basically, um, it also improves uh, instructors' teaching practice through innovation practices of pedagogical aspects and also improve the curriculum. And in SOTL, we also systematically gather some data, some reflection data from students uh, that can um, help get self-reflection of instructor itself, and also lead to evidence-based teaching practices to improve students' learning outcomes. Of course, publish uh, research results, the data based on that, see how the students' learning improve and based on that. And over time, uh, the instructor will have, is aware of his own classroom techniques, how, how students are responding. That creates a confidence in the instructor also to, to go and experiment a little more about increasing learning aspects of the students. 
I like this cartoon about teaching and learning. Uh, it says, uh, I taught Stripe uh, how to whistle. Uh, I don't hear him whistling, then he says, uh, I just I taught him, I didn't say he'll learn it. <laughs> okay, so learning is not an obvious uh, outcome of teaching all the time. Okay, so, for example, in the teaching centered approaches, the emphasis always is on content delivery. How to finish the syllabus, you know, complete, finish this one, finish that one, completely one after the other. And typically, we use the textbook based closed form. Um, decontextualize textual problems. So there's no context in that. And trying to find solutions and typically use summative assessment, which is structured. So that means midterm one, midterm two, final exam. That's the kind of structure. And of course, the ob objective is to provide foundational information about the subject, whatever you teach. In the learning center approach, the emphasis on learning builds some meaning with process-oriented uh, activities that include some case study-based or open-ended project-based learning kind of things. And it's just learning, uh, just finding solutions. They also involve developing some hypothesis kind of thing. And also use a lot of formative assessment. When the learning is happening, you ought to give the feedback. Okay. Typically, we use homework for that. But homeworks are typically graded very harsh. You know, typically, sometimes if you don't realize that, students are just learning. You need to give them feedback. Um, the pedagogy is a set of practices and theories for teaching, and there are many pedagogical theories uh, defined by mostly psychologists. And uh, the constructivist the theory of knowledge, for example, says that uh, learning is an active uh, contextualized process and uh, constructing knowledge based on personal experiences that involves emotions. Also, learning always involves emotions. And in a social environment. So three uh, three important terms here. Number one is the context realization of the learning. Number two, the emotions involved. Number three is the social environment. I want to take the example of the Gurukul concept of ancient Indian education system, where there will be a single guru, a guru will teach everything for you, not only the occasional uh, type of things, includes social skills, human values, everything in a social environment, because the learning is happening in a social environment naturally, because the context is not diluted, and the emotions are always involved in the learning. Okay. So why context and emotion are so important? Just take a simple example of, I want to teach a toddler how much is two plus two. In order to bring the context, I may say, hey, if you have two candies, and your brother decided not to eat his candies, he's going to give you two more, how many are you going to get? So the moment you do that, you are bringing the context that creates engagement in the learner. And the emotion also, it is proved by neuro, neuro, neuroscience that it creates cognitive functions that improves your problem solving. The moment you bring the context and emotion to the learning, it becomes much more fun for the learner. The other aspect is, a couple of aspects I, I, I wanted to introduce is compartmentalization of knowledge. And so much of knowledge is, of course, we can't teach everything in uh, connecting the dots in a class. We compartmentalize that. And decontextualize problems. Textbook problems are, doesn't bring the context most of the time. They are mostly defined based on idealized structures or something like that. So what is the issue with that? Well, the real world problems are mostly highly uh, intervened, and there are a lot of interactions involved in that. Context and stakeholders are involved in a real world problem. The moment you compartmentalize that, you may be oversimplifying it. The moment you are decontextualizing that, you are mostly imagine, imagine problems. In both the cases, uh, you may be doing uh, there's a lack of system and critical thinking skills. You may be losing that while teaching the course, which is so narrow into compartmentalization. I want to again go back to Gurukul. Of course, we can't have Gurukul systems. A teacher cannot teach everything in a classroom. We cannot we cannot connect the dots for all the courses students are learning, but can we bring context and emotion to learning? This is the objective of this talk. I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, approaches I've been using. The learning center approaches I've been using as part of bringing the context and learning, uh, context and uh, emotion into the learning. Uh, creative ideation methods, uh, socio-technical project-based learning, how to bring in diversity and sense of belonging while learning. 
and some process oriented approaches in content industry courses like dev bots and statics and machine design which I also taught before and talk about some ongoing work. So because majority of my um, classroom experiments are happened in 1770, the semi-freshman design course, I want to talk, briefly talk about the history of that. Uh, this was in 1999, Georgia Tech moved from uh, quarter system to um, semester curriculum. At that time, School of MBNC created this uh, particular course, engineering, uh, graphics, and design. And, uh, and until 2002, it was a textbook-based course with uh, time-bound exams. And um, in 2002, some formative summative assessments experiments were done in the classroom and they were shared in one of the conference papers I was reading the other day. And then in 2005, I started teaching and started introducing some project-based approaches in stuff, time-bound exams. And um, in 2013, civil engineering decided to have their own sections. No, now we have ME1670, I have only ME students and aerospace, AE students. In 2014, I think uh, we have introduced manufacturing and, and uh, prototyping aspects since in 1670. That was time, I think Dr. Bill Weber was the chair and he had an NSF project. As part of that, we introduced these things. And that is the time I think uh, Julie and Kate were also uh, uh, hired and then they also introduced uh, uh, perspective sketching instead of isometrics to, to, to maybe something to do with the industrial design kind of thing. And in 2020, I think it was changed to 1670 for some reasons, I, I'm not sure. So today's uh, 1670 class involves coming with uh, creative idea, ideas for design, sketch them in terms of 3D and two-dimensional views, orthographic processes, adding dimensions, adding tolerances. And once idea matures, take it to the CAD, model individual components, assemble them, animate them, animate them all the way for functional design, sometimes, or maybe take the form design, take it to 3D print, 3D print it. So it is now completely changed into a project-based course where there are two types of projects, individual projects, which are called 3D printing projects, focusing on the form design, how it looks. Whereas the team projects is functional design, how it works. So students have to learn how it looks, how it works, both of them using CAD models. The how it looks, take it, take it all the way to 3D print. How it works, take it, take it all the way to animations in, in, the, in the CAD, they're going to learn. So they have a complete understanding of uh, at least some terminology related to form design and function. They start in all three semesters and uh, thousand students per, per year. It's a, it's a big course. A lot of students take this course of holding the requirement for AE and ME right now. You see, civil engineering is also not there. So I'll briefly talk about some kind of the conceptual design stage uh, to introduce, because they're doing projects, we wanted to introduce some uh, creative and critical thinking skills in the, in, in the classroom. So based on some literature available for the um, uh, you know, conceptual design stages of ideation stage of design, we introduce some divergent methods. So you need to start with, normally design means you start with uh, specifications and constraints. When you do specifications constraints, you're already boxed with the ideation. You can't come out of the box. So you need to think of out of box uh, ideas. We introduce some fun field, some fun activities like, hey, can you think of uh, taking uh, functionalities of two components and join them and see come up with a the product. They introduce, for example, is an example of a, a team project where they take the functionality of a, a tennis ball dispenser, an army tranker, and come up with a with a CAD model of a product, which is fun for them, even though we don't talk about feasibility of design or manufacturability of that. That is not at this level. The idea is to use the CAD tools to, for with the fun thing. Similarly, uh, one of the other uh, uh, divergent approach is absurdity. You come with an absurd idea and at some point nicely converge with specifications of constraint to come up with a meaningful product. In this case, it's a lab activity. You come up with an uh, anatomy of a hippo and convert that into a, into, a, into a trash can for Georgia Tech campus. And then converting the various uh, anatomy of hippos into a more functional thing that needed for, for a trash can. So they, they understand the connection between the form design and function design. And this is where um, uh, non-judgmental and open-ended thing kind of things, where it's a 3D printed project, a beverage mug for Georgia Tech Athletic Association, being very, very open-ended. You don't uh, you don't nip in the bud any of the ideas, take it all the way to see whether it can 3D printable or not. And that, that, that leads to some creativity. And you see, here is an example of a uh, challenging assumptions. That means removing all the fictitious uh, specifications of uh, constraints you may have in the design and say, 
I'm going to remove that, how I come up with the product that doesn't have any fictitious constraint. Again, they use it in the team project. Okay. So we also introduced uh, structure ideation methods to combine them because at some point, even though you have a divergent thinking, uh, to make a meaningful product, you need to have convergent thinking. So we introduced that together. And students come up with interesting products. Uh, you can see them, this is a 3D print project uh, where you start with the idea, sketch them, add them, assemble them, 3D print them. You can see the wonderful thing, even though its functionality is not required in this case, because of the 3D printing facilities we have, student planning the functionality also well in advance and able to do the, the kind of, that she gave me actually that as an extra extra copy as a gift to me and I just on my table in my office. It's a wonderful, it works actually. Okay, so that is the first part where we just introduced uh, the typical uh, 3D uh, related approaches to design thinking, this is something much more, uh, uh, this thing where based on some Georgia Tech uh, related uh, strat strategic plans related one. The motivation for bringing in um, socio-technical project-based learning is, uh, in one of the uh, alumni survey in 2012, I think, when students were asked about uh, how much Georgia Tech prepared you for some discipline skills or interpersonal skills, majority of students said, yeah, Georgia Tech really helped us doing these things. And asked specifically about uh, the cultural impact, social and cultural impact of, on their professional practice or the environmental impact on the professional practice. The numbers were kind of low in the sense students say, we didn't talk about much in the classroom about that. So that was the reason for the QEP, Quality Enhancement Program, from which they created SLS. All of you, many of you know that one, Sutherland and Sustain Center. The objective of the center is to bring in um, uh, the, the sustainability aspect into the classroom and see how that can help students understand these concepts. So based on that, we had some inter interventions in the classroom where a couple of just-in-time lectures to introduce some terminology related to sustainability uh, in terms of uh, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and, and, uh, and economic sustainability, give those terminology to students and try to introduce some, some activities at lab, lab level, individual project level, 3D project level, where they can choose, instead of choosing some standard uh, things they normally do, we bring in, we give them some choice for to pick up some projects related to sustainability. And for example, in the case of individual projects, uh, they design products that promote uh, sustainable resource use. I'll be talking about that a little bit about that. In the team project, they use uh, humanitarian design problems uh, with SDGs, um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them. You choose from them and uh, some of the projects related to them. Of course, in the, in the lab activities also, we give them some case studies with a context and saying that, for example, in the case of this, you're supposed to develop a recycling container for Georgia Tech campus. And we're going to give them a lot of videos related to um, automated trash management in Barcelona, some videos. And in Georgia Tech itself, uh, how the waste management happens, um, sustain waste. So students go through these things and come up with products um, that can, can create a story out of that based on what they learn. They already learned how to come up with creative ideas. They already learned how to sketch perspective views. They already learned how to create multi-view drawings and put numbers on them. So based on that, they're going to create a story and say, hey, this is my product. So they just started uh, introducing those concepts at, uh, at lab level. And then we, they move on to individual 3D printing projects where they're going to create the products that are sustainable, that can promote sustainable resource use. Uh, this was, and again, from design literature, uh, we found a product that where they come up with the products that can make the uh, explicit, uh, uh, implicit information explicit. That means if I want to control how much water I'm using, how, how much control, how much electricity I'm using at my home, I don't, I, I can't remember that. Sometimes I have that behavior, I lose that behavior, I lose the motivation. Because a user has to remember that he has to be more, more, more responsible and he has to continue to maintain that, monitor that, resist the temptation of using more. It happens to all of us, we know that. And then how do you do that? Can, uh, can design can help me with that? So these mechanical design components can take the hidden information exclusively. And they make, uh, they reduce the cognitive load. Cognitive load means I have to remember. Uh, to, to, by the end of this month, I'll get the electricity bill, then, oh, man, I used again more. So I, I can't remember that when I'm using it. So these products are supposed to have them built-in mechanism that can, that can remind you to do that. 
so that we can persist that behavior. That is the concept, and we gave that uh, research paper to students to read about it and gave some examples of those products to introduce that in uh, in the individual projects. So they come up with an idea, uh, again, CAD it, take it all the way to 3D print. For example, this was one of the students' work, uh, water saving shower head with uh, external representation design that can give, that can, that it will stop the water flow after some time, um, after you use certain amount of gallons or whatever you use. So that is basically making the hidden information explicit and reducing the cognitive load and things. So there are a variety of products using the same concept. Uh, some interesting ones are uh, the ones you can see here, this one. Uh, this is also created a functional design of it, very interesting one, where after a certain amount of uh, using certain gallons of water, it folds, reduces the flow of the water, I mean, the intensity, and keep on folding, folding after some time, it completely stops. That was an idea. Even though they are not really functional to the level we can do in the, in the case of Capstone Design, students come up with here, the idea is to execute how to use those ideas. And students also like that. And here is a uh, co comment from the students. Uh, I think a sustainable project challenged me my previous conceptions. I believe engineering design was about finding and creating a new idea. Uh, what I have learned is now that it is not only just creating an idea, but great, uh, doing um, coming up with ideas that for greater purpose and improvement. That is the comment. So previously, they were using uh, coffee mugs and, and uh, what, bottles for individual projects. Now. They have a choice to pick up something more meaningful that can bring in sustainability aspect into the individual property. And similarly, uh, we wanted to introduce that in the team projects. Um, so this is uh, bringing in the sustainability development goals, 17 of them. Um, so basically, again, the learning with the context. Here, the main objective is can system, can students can develop any system thinking skills which are missing when you isolate a problem, decontextualize a problem don't have that system level thinking. In the context, for example, if you're doing a product, generally you talk about specifications and constraints. What the user wants, what user doesn't want in the, in the case of that. But if you bring in the context, there are two more factors. What is the context here? Who are the stakeholders? Are they creating any additional specification constraint for me design? So those kind of introductory lectures will be given to students to introduce. And here are some of the uh, real world problem here, Proctor Creek, Waterhead, uh, watershed headland. I remember uh, attending this with the uh, SLS uh, traveling to that particular place. They have my mold and mild view problems. So um, we want to develop low cost dehumidifier for, low, for the low income community there. So that was the context, that was the theme, that was the introduction given to students with, the, with certain information. And they come up with a variety of ideas for dehumidifier, even though they are not completely functional, but the idea was sound in terms of appreciating the SDG aspects into that. They also come up with idea like, for example, um, a multi a multi home dehumidifier. It can supply, uh, it can it can take care of multiple homes in a in a in a common facility that can create uh, dehumidifiers. Again, students like uh, these uh, uh, ideas. Uh, here is an idea. Here is a comment from students. They think that um, they, they, their discipline can be useful to others and community and that increases their passion for engineering. Again, here, moving from a cartoon characters for, for the team projects and to more meaningful um, sustainable related projects. There you can see a variety of them. I have a website and actually, actually I have a YouTube channel also. Uh, I don't know whether I can click this one and works. I just quickly show you the functional designs they go or to what extent they can go. I don't know if we can go and come back on that. I guess so. So here is the final uh, product uh, animation from students. It's a five-member team. Uh, each member work on some sub-assembly and finally make it um, show the functionality of the product they have. This is a collapsible um, home for uh, communities or where uh, they have limited space or it is portable also. So there are some constraint, additional constraints that come with context and uh, and, um, and because of that, uh, and, and the stakeholders, so you can do that. So this is the four minute, this thing, I'll, I'll skip that just to show you the idea here. I just wanted to get that one. Can I go back to my, yeah, that was the last uh, slide in that aspect. So now switch the gears and let's talk about a little bit of 
another uh, MA School of ME and uh, Georgia Tech level uh, interest in DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. How to bring those things into the classroom in the context of particularly in the engineering design point of view, the course I was teaching. So here, the motivation, of course, again, again from Georgia Tech's point of view, um, the candidate plan of Georgia Tech diversity, equity, inclusion has three uh, goals there. First one is create an equitable, inclusive community. The second one, recruit, retain students, faculty, staff, diverse community. The third one is the support, innovative, inclusion, scholarship, and teaching. There are two components in that again. The first one is uh, curricular innovations that can prepare Georgia Tech students uh, for cross-culturally competent, uh, globally-minded leaders. It was an interesting one. Uh, the second one is uh, inclusive learning and inclusive teaching aspect. So with that as uh, motivation, and also there is some literature available on social integration between two sets of classrooms. In a classroom, in a class of 50 students, there are some uh, international students. There are some students from US. You can see them here, the freshman engineering students. When the freshman engineering students join, a, uh, like Georgia Tech, for example, uh, they had separated from their own high school support groups, and they're new to Georgia Tech. They have their own uh, constraints, inefficiencies. Similarly, international freshman students, for example, they have low level of social integration. Uh, they, are, they take more time to integrate with the rest of them. Uh, is it possible to socially integrate them so that both can get, get benefited from this? So that is the idea here. The international students' well-being as well as domestic students can learn the culture of other people, culture awareness of those two, a combination of these two. So that was the idea. And uh, there's also a lot of literature available on sense of belonging, why sense of belonging is important, but particularly when you're learning. Um, so it, it, it helps well-being, self-esteem. Uh, in, in the lack of Lack of sense of belonging can lead to isolation, loneliness, and even depression. When the students have a sense of belonging, they're motivated, they take the ownership of learning, and they take risks and their positive relations, and the higher academic expectations for them. And also create safe and uh, supporting environment. You cannot bring this by just giving a pep talk. Hey guys, sense of belonging is very important, we'll do that. How to integrate that to some curriculum so that they can, they can feel it. So that was the idea here to create a, a 3D printing project on culture, in, culture inspired home decorative design. There's also a lot of literature in design community, uh, how to bring in culture. Companies like Taiwan have exploited this in the international market. They come up with wonderful products with that. So the idea is to come up with a 3D printable uh, culture inspired home decoration. The definition of cultural rights are very broad. Uh, you can bring in language, nationality, aesthetics, architecture, religion, deliberation, rituals, myths, customs, clothing, whatnot. You can put everything into that. And then uh, they have to show the cultural influence uh, as part of a form design, something to represent their culture. Okay, you can see some of the products here. By looking at them, you can show it is culturally specific. These, these, their form designs are cultural specific. So when we did that for introduce this for four sections, four times 50, 200 students, we, when we did the, the analysis, found 57 different unique cultures globally in the classroom of four sections, 200 students. And uh, some of them are grouped, okay? For example, some students say, hey, I'm from Maryland, I'm from Georgia, I'm from Louisiana. When I was growing up, these were the thing, they create a story and also create a small video, two minutes video. They say that uh, because of this, this is, I'm going to introduce this product with those concepts into that. We grouped them to, together into uh, American, even though uh, it was not a specific thing to do that. In that case, so these are the 57 things. And students really enjoy this. So relating my culture, something I love so much, and my major, something that I have so much interest in, made this project enjoyable and meaningful. Okay. Um, similarly, uh, the sense of belonging, they're supposed to take this product and to, they, they go to their teams. There's they, a the team project, their individual project. They take the product to the team and say, hey, this is my product, my 3D printing, what do you think about it? So that was, again, there is a sense of belonging there and then they talk about, they are, want to listen to your story, you want to listen to their story in that process, uh, that sense of belonging definitely improved and students really enjoyed that. So a variety of products you can see there, sketch them, carry them, 3D print them, so the cultural uh, aspects can be shown as in the, in the, in the form of the form design. And self-expression and authentic self is another a couple of things students always mention about that in their uh, in their in their comments after the post activity. 
Another interesting factor was the cross-cultural representation. If your parents from different countries, India and Indian and Western, students come up with fusion projects which are very interesting, creative. They're creative, and that fusion has brought, brought really very interesting things. A Jewish heritage with the Indian lineage. There were the two products combined together to create different products there. So that fusion uh, that creates multiple cultures. And the literature also uh, says that students always bring their cultural capital to the learning. Uh, cultural capital can influence your learning so that you're bringing slightly into the learning process. So that is definitely can help you in the learning, learning aspects. And students go out of my comfort zone. I went out of my comfort zone because I have the freedom to do that, keeping that open-ended uh, project-based learning can help them to go beyond expectation for what they're supposed to do. And then I'm, I'm so happy to share with my grandmother and they're happy about what they, they produced. So that was uh, one aspect of diversity we introduced in the classroom. The second one is uh, the one aspect of EA thing. The second one is actual diversity itself. We introduced that in the team projects by choosing teams uh, with uh, diversity. There is a software called CATME that says uh, comprehensive uh, assessment of team member effectiveness. This is from Purdue University, I guess. So this software can be used and students will be asked, asked questions on various uh, bases, city, gender, identity, availability, um, and report leadership. And then based on that, the instructor will decide the teams. And of course, we're based on the constraint of the classroom itself. We had a uh, race, uh, the level of diversity in race and ethnicity is 60 to 40, 60 percent, 40 percent the remaining thing. And gender is, of course, even low 20 percent uh, uh, female and 80 percent male kind of. That is the limitation of the work. But still, we could able to uh, create some kind of uh, engagement, role of engagement in the diverse teams in terms of what they can do, what they cannot do, uh, some guidelines and rules and uh, some joint responsibilities telling them to, uh, you know, interacting respectfully and things like that and create a platform for them to interact and quantify some of their evaluation again using the same software it can look for five different teamwork dimensions and try to understand how that helped or not helped in many cases it's not always guaranteed that teamworks uh, diverse teams can be helpful sometimes they have challenges to some of the students didn't like that aspect of it for whatever reasons maybe personal reasons whatever it is they didn't like it so everybody has to uh, uh, reach the other students in terms of these dimensions. And we had some conclusions on that one, and they're still improving. So that is the uh, kind of uh, first part of the, my major uh, contributions in SOTL, which I primarily used in 1670. And of course, I also teach uh, ME 4042 in some much. In addition to that, I had the opportunity to teach other courses, which are very content intensive textbook based problems. Okay, we go in, walk in, start writing on the board, Students will be taking notes. So that kind of course is uh, 3180. I taught for three, four semesters. <clears throat> 30 to 10, last three, four semesters, I've been teaching this. And statics and deformable bodies, I taught many times before. And 6124, of course, final element method, I taught a couple of times also. I also had the opportunity to teach uh, a special topics course, ME 8803 uh, and uh, 8843. This is with uh, Dr. Chex Jiang. Uh, we combined together, we created video. This is a distance learning course. The point here is again um, in the content intensive courses, how to engage students? What are the approaches I can use? Uh, one of the approaches I used was the process oriented approach. I was teaching 16, 1770. Uh, students are aware of that, what I know what they are aware of. I can see some faces, I can recognize some faces who are already done 1770 with me. I know the CAD uh, uh, they have done before. I know most of the students do MATLAB. And for example, in, in, uh, in, uh, in 3180, we introduced along with uh, I should acknowledge Dr. Stephen Lang, uh, Lang I think we, we did together in three different semesters. We taught the course with purely textbook based. Uh, one is purely total process oriented, you know, trying to create a lot of activities for students using MATLAB and CAD uh, to, 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 to do certain textbook problems in machine design and also combined approach and try to conclude some, some aspect from that students like the integrated approach, doing a little bit of process oriented, a little bit of textbook combined together. So here is an example of a how to design a spring. Uh, the prayer knowledge is in uh, when that time in 1770, we were using Auto, AutoCAD uh, inventor, inventor software. It has a tool called uh, Design Accelerator Tool. It can have can talk about individual very. It has a component component generator 
that all the machine design, uh, many components like gears and shafts and springs and all, it can do in terms of uh, mechanical calculator that can do whatever you can do in machine design, we teach normally, and also create shear force and bending moment diagrams also if they want to do that. So I want to integrate that one along with MATLAB code to do a textbook problem and verify your answers with two more than one approach to do that. So that was very interesting and students liked it. Similarly, I introduced uh, 31 in the deformable bodies project-based learning. The final exam is 25% grading. Students get very nervous about final exams. So I'm going to say, hey, out of 25% of teammates in the final exam, I'm going to give you 10% uh, for, team pro for the project where you come up with a product or an engineering structure, identify all the mechanical components, all the engineering components you learned in this class, identify all the loading, um, variety of loading conditions you learned in this class, and give me a force stress analysis, give me a, uh, a kind of free body diagram and everything, and give me the design for uh, maximum stress kind of thing. And, and I, I will even provide them the number type of equation that's used from the textbook and give me a solution for that. So that was the thing students liked it before it kind of helped them for the prepare for the final exam also because they're going through the textbook and going through the equations and they one, one more time. So that helped them to, uh, to consolidate and, and, and a similar one is also used um, uh, in the 3210. Here is very interesting much more because you can also bring in, you come up with an engineering structure with uh, DFMA and identifying uh, theoretically necessary and not, not necessary components and doing manufacturing process selection with EduPAC uh, and doing the material selection with EduPAC. And EduPAC also can give uh, the carbon footprint based on your selection of materials and processes. So that gives them a much more uh, system level, uh, you know, integration of knowledge they learn in the course. Uh, some students liked it, uh, you know, even though I have not really um, took it to the next level of this one. <clears throat> so that ends my, my second experiment in a, in a content intensive courses and uh, I just want to briefly talk about a couple of uh, new things we were talking and uh, um, you know Devish is also very interested in this project. This is, this is a new one we just started with Amit. Uh, Amit is here and we just want to introduce uh, some interventions. This is not uh, this uh, uh, pedagogy is not new in literature. Undergrads teaching undergrads always helps. Okay, so in, not only in terms of uh, a cognitive aspect, in terms of attitude also for seniors. And all. So we want to bring in this uh, by bringing, um, using the same projects from industry, uh, assign that to, to, to 16, 70 students, and of course the team, uh, the capstone design is doing the same thing, and see how that's going to and provide a platform for them to interact with each other, and see what is the effect of that on their learning. And we want to take this level, <coughs> and uh, Devesh is also very interested in this project. Let's go to that. And this is something new, uh, I just started, we call the mindfulness aspects in the classroom. Uh, the provost uh, has started this website, I know how many of you might have seen that. They identified many aspects of uh, mindfulness, um, uh, many aspects of well-being that includes mindfulness, for example. So I came up with one of the um, uh, campus uh, student organization called Sky. It's, it's a student club, I think they do meditation and other types of uh, aspects. So they invited one time to my classroom and uh, did a one session with them. Students like that because they just want to be forward. It's a three hour lab. Three hour lab is very stressful for them. Just I take first five, 10 minutes of it and say, hey, uh, let's talk about that. And then starting them to understand their own awareness. The understanding of aware awareness is very important for students. What is their limitation, what their constraint? When you really take it, take a calm mind and able to understand your own learning approach, uh, awareness is an important. I want to really see how this can integrate that to, to level up. Okay. I know I already took, I thought around the 35, 40 minutes, it took a little more than that. So I want to thank all my 7,000 students, uh, which I taught over <laughs> for 18 years. Um, uh, initially, they complained about my accent, of course. Uh, then they thoroughly discussed about my mustache. <laughs> uh, they also scolded me for not responding to emails. This guy never responds to email. That's what they write every time. I am. It's hard for me. Five sections, two fifty students. You can imagine how many emails I get. So I just stopped stopped responding to them. And of course, they gave uh, very interesting comments about my teaching. They always uh, gave very, very, very encouraging comments. One of them stuck with me for a long time. I want to read it for you. 
Dr. is absolutely one of the best professors that Georgia Tech has. You should give him a ride. I love that. 107 is, I don't know why that 107 coming. 107 tears and let him teach every class. I don't like that part. Actually, the second part is more happening. I think I end up teaching more classes. I think you should look for the first one. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, that is uh, something interesting. And I, I mean, always enjoy that working with students. And uh, it's interesting. Some of their comments are very, uh, very interesting. Some of them comments, of course, they scold you. I mean, uh, course, you should be able to take a prize. You should be able to take that one also. I want to thank my collaborators, uh, see from uh, CTO, CTO and SLS uh, and Sismic, who work with me. many of us, uh, their SOTL projects. I really enjoy working with them. They know how to quantify learning. Okay, I know how to experiment, but they know how to quantify learning. They give you ideas uh, how to how to quantify learning. It is a little laborious, but sometimes it's really worth doing that. I want to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, starting from uh, Mike Stewart, uh, uh, who gave me this introduction to this course first. And today, up to today, Dennis, Dennis is not here, unfortunately. He has a class. And our class, our uh, this thing is very difficult to attend seminars. Our, we, he teaches five sections, I teach five sections. Very difficult to accommodate certain things. Uh, Dennis is a wonderful person to work. And uh, in between, of course, I have a lot of colleagues, my uh, uh, Julie and Kate, really wonderful. I learned a lot of things from them. Um, and uh, if I forget any other colleagues, I'm thank. But thanks to Suresh. Suresh was my mentor, as I said. I, throughout my career at Georgia Tech, he helped me in every. Thank you, Suresh. Really appreciate that. Uh, of course, my family. Uh, my wife, Shailaja, is here. Uh, she's a research faculty at, uh, at uh, Emory. Um, we started our journey at IASC. We have a, um, as a, as a PhD. She was in microbiology, and um, I was in uh, aerospace engineering. That's our two-body problem started from there. <laughs> and uh, in IASC Bangalore, you go for a PhD, um, and there's a good chance you come out not only with PhD but with, with your life partner. <laughs> it happened with us, and then we both went to Singapore for a for a postdoctoral position. I was at uh, uh, in US and she was, uh, I was at NTU, she was at NTU, only two universities at that time. And then I said, uh, I want to go to US, so I went to Purdue, Purdue University again, she moved with me. And then by the time uh, my, my, my older one, Ananta was born, and then uh, I said, uh, hey, I want to go to Georgia Tech, came to Georgia Tech 2000. <laughs> and then that time my older one, my younger one, Adi was born. And uh, the two-body problem become multi-body problem, you know. <laughs> and my wife said, no more moving. OK, decided to go to Georgia Tech. That's one of the reasons for which stayed 23 years at Georgia Tech. And wonderful to do that. And uh, thanks for it. And she also listened to all my classroom stories. Um, some of them exciting, some of them you know, frustrating. <laughs> so she takes that one. Uh, two boys, uh, Anantu, my older one, he's in the uh, uh, University of Maryland uh, Medical School. He's doing his MD, PhD. He finished his. Uh, Graduated from Emory actually in uh, uh, neurobiology and minor in computer science. He's doing MD PhD, which is the ATS program. My younger one, Adi, is here. He's a uh, uh, junior. Uh, junior. In, <laughs> yeah, I keep track of things. Junior in uh, Emory. He's also doing uh, biology major. Planning to do a uh, uh, minor in artificial intelligence. Emory has come up with a new minor in artificial intelligence. He also interested in. Uh, so both the boys, uh, the, when 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 you are mentoring seven thousand students. That should help in parenting, right? So <laughs> I use, sometimes use my, my mentoring techniques in the parenting, my parenting technique in the classroom, OK? So it kind of helped me in both ways. And uh, it was a nice experience. You know, it was a wonderful experience to, uh, to parenting as well as mentoring students, OK? I want to end my talk with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with a sloka from, uh, from Sanskrit, OK? Tato tustit tato mana, tato mana, tato bhava. That means the mind is where the focus is. The emotion is where the mind is. And the ecstasy, the joy of learning is where the emotion is. In the context of learning, these things are sequentially coupled. Okay? You are teaching and learning should, should provide that opportunity to do that. Okay, with that, I want to take questions. Thanks for appreciation for 15 minutes. Lecture is not small. Thank you so much. Questions? I, I have no idea about the wellspring of creative ideas coming out of this uh, class. So thank you for sharing that. And it seems like many of them also are feasible 
do you see any students interested in continuing the project after the semester is over? Right. You want to talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I've just, he just, when I walked in, he just came and, hey, I took your course last time. I'm using in 2110. So, yeah, it is students always. Uh, I mean, I also have one slide in the last lecture. I tell them, guys, you're taking 1670. How this feed into other courses? starting from 2110 all the way to capstone. I, I try to see where it works. I also talk about your I2P program, where idea to prototype, where students can use this knowledge. You see many uh, competitions in Georgia Tech. When I came in Georgia Tech first time in 2000, I just go to classroom, textbook, play screen. Now there are so many opportunities for students. So this course, uh, people say, students say that there is the foundation for them to go for it. I introduce them. I tell them, hey, first question I ask in the classroom is, how many wants to continue? How, want, how many wants to do MBA? Uh, at least four or five students to write their hand. I'll say, guys, by end of the semester, my objective is to, to tell all the post, to, to convince all those five students not to go to MBA, continue in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the things where uh, just the retaining students in engineering, um, that it's a really exciting course, honestly. I don't know, the, really College of Engineering, but it's a wonderful course. Students also mentioned that, you know, because they won't take many discipline-specific courses as a freshman. This is a discipline-specific course as a freshman. It's a foundation for a lot of them, so definitely they use a lot. I'm guessing that. Yeah. Yeah. So excellent talk, and really wonderful to see all the you know creative experiments you've run. Certainly, it's inspiring. I think uh, most of us will probably spend less time in the classroom. <laughs> I'm more inspired to probably spend more time. <laughs> Maybe I say this because I'm older now, uh, but you know the question about. I've always struggled with uh, balancing open-endedness, which real-world problems are open-ended. Obviously, in a time-bound setting where we are teaching content, it's hard to balance. So it's always a struggle. But one aspect of that struggle is how do you, if you do give open-ended problems, which you are giving, how do you actually evaluate them in an objective manner so that students feel that they are all being evaluated and assessed in a, in a uniform way. Right. Uh, there are, of course, <coughs> for the two, uh, ideation and all, we have developed uh, uh, some rubrics for creative ideation methods, but they've come up with a 3D product uh, interface with an idea, sketching them, getting them all the way to 3D print. To understand uh, how much of creativity involved in that, we have creative, uh, there are some rubrics for that, literature also have that. Yeah, but the open-ended project, like team projects, are sometimes very difficult to do that. We have some standard rubrics in terms of, the, I want to separate the content with the uh, openness in, the, in terms of that. The content is always, do you understand what is your idea? You have your own, you distribute the entire system and the, you are designing for functionality into five different modules. One may be working on the landing gear, one may be working on the cockpit area, if you take an aircraft, for example. So each of them working on their own uh, individual sub-assembly sub level things. Uh, almost 60% of grading is based on your own sketches, fundamentals you learn in sketching, your own uh, multi-view drawings, your own dimensioning, your own uh, balancing uh, those networks in terms of concepts, um, your own uh, complexity in CAD modeling, your own assembly CAD modeling, and your own demonstration of uh, the functionality of landing gear, how it works. Okay, so it's mostly, it's, it's not, they can't complain about that. If the landing gear is not working, students are going to lose the points, okay? The, the system level, um, the application point of view is very limited. At the system level, how you can write the report as a team, maybe 10 or 15 points for that. So I never had that uh, really interesting. I'm not separating it uh, from the concept. So it is embedded into that. So uh, yeah, you're right. Sometimes uh, because it's a project-based kind of course like that, it may be easy. Uh, if it is a real uh, content-based, it may be different. It's a, it's a great talk that you gave. Uh, teaching is a great profession. It enhances not only students' lives, but also our own lives as instructors. And that shows in your presentation how much you enjoy teaching and learning in the classroom. So I'm not surprised by the kind of things that students say, including race. <laughs> <laughs> You, you closed your talk, your talk, protect your son uh, with AI and, and biology. AI is going to be there. So far, we have not used AI as much in capstone design or most of the other courses. 
as you look into the next 10 years, you wonder, how do we do that? How do we take AI into our capstone department, taking into consideration the context and other aspects that you want? Do you have any thoughts? Let me give a general uh, this thing. Even though I was talking about from the Google age uh, to, to, to the thing, even though the technology and knowledge has improved, the basic learning, philosophy of learning is, is it's always natural, isn't it? So that's the general statement. Uh, specific to AI and all, uh, I don't have any specific thoughts on that. I never thought about that. At least in my courses, there's no plagiarism because they can't use AI to create a CAD model. At least I am I'm away from that right now. Yeah, in content intensive courses, it is difficult to give a homework problem or, or any essay based questions nowadays. It doesn't make any sense. You know, the cut and paste is very easy for them to do that. And of course, instructors have to use their own uh, tools to understand how much of uh, is plagiarism here and how much of them get, getting it from the AI. So, in terms of the mechanical engineering itself, I may not be in a position to really talk about that. Definitely, many, many, many of you are thinking about that, how to bring in that. It will have definitely. Uh, this thing on manufacturing and uh, and other aspects uh, in terms of uh, at the economy level, at the maybe at the at the U.S. level or maybe at the international level, but bringing that to the classroom level needs much more uh, much more thought process, much more thinking. Honestly, I I am I'm not qualified to talk about that at this time. Uh, maybe yeah, I'll leave it to the. Would I be able to speak a few minutes on your behalf and my experience in your class? Uh, yeah, a yes. minute or so. I'm sure minute or two. Of chain, yes. so, all right. So my name is David. I'm a third year mechanical engineering student. And Dr. Pooch's class was one of my favorite classes that, that I've taken at Tech so far. One of the things that he did that really set him apart from other professors was that he has a clear sense of purpose. Many classes we take at Tech, we don't really understand why we take them. We do all this complicated math and physics classes, and you know, all of us are able to memorize the information, and then next semester we all leave, and then we don't really know what we learned, similar to that visual he showed. With Dr. Pooch's class, I'm very happy to say that everything I learned from the designing, from understanding how to think and turning my ideas to reality, I really like absorbed it and learned it because I was able to work with my peers in class through a group project. I was able to design my own water bottle. I made a tech-themed water bottle. I designed it from scratch. I drew it out. I catted it. And then when I, I was able to turn that into reality. So through all those activities, being able to really work with what you learn in like a project-based environment is the best way to fully learn something. And I'm so honored and to have had you as my professor. And congratulations on winning this award. Thank you. Thanks. First of all, like a great job. It's uh, inspiring to see creative innovations in a course like CAD. What's your vision for the next maybe 10 years or 20 years? Where do you see this course being involved in? Given Maybe piggybacking on Suresh's question about AI or some of the other techniques. Yeah, it's uh, the, the initial uh, thought process of any instructor is uh, we resist any changes. Okay, it happened to me in all the things. Oh, even though I showed so many experiments, everything I resisted for a couple of years, couple of semesters, and I hated it when I implemented it. Okay, it takes a lot of time and resources, and students write bad comments when, particularly when you are evolving, saying that what are you asking me? I don't know. I came to learn CAD, and what are you talking about here? So there are comments like that, it happens. So you ought to be very careful changing the curriculum. And I, I mean, I'm sure all of you understand that it is not easy to change curriculum changes. It doesn't happen over time. In the last 23 years, I was talking about, so uh, those changes happened uh, at the Georgia Tech level in terms of uh, design engineering competition. At curriculum level also, it took almost 20 years to do that. Uh, I don't think it, it can happen overnight, but uh, it is very gradual. You may not know that uh, it will happen. But as I said, again, same answer. I don't have that vision really, particularly in the context of the AI. Uh, I'm honest with you, I, I don't know what, what changes it will happen. Thank you. Maybe just a comment. Yeah, sure. That, you know, in generative design is something that is based on AI. It's very developed, or it's developing the tools out there. Maybe one way. This is just a common suggestion. Sure. Exactly how you bring it in and how do you 
get students to understand what's behind the scenes that's enabling them may require a lot more background than students have in 1670. But just to be able to even um, be exposed to the idea of uh, how AI can enable generative designs, where ideas, you can ideate, your ideation can be helped, uh, can be one way, perhaps. That's absolutely right. I just want to shift gear a little bit I, um, and uh, from the discussion, uh, which was, I think, heavy started getting more towards engineering. Right. And I want to to actually maybe emphasize or, or ask you to maybe talk a little bit more about one aspect that you profoundly stated in the beginning, but I think spend a little bit less time just in your discussion, just given the, sure. the time available is this aspect of emotion as, right. a, as a critical part of learning for both parts. Right. Obviously, we all know the emotion that produces a joy of learning something, that, right. you know, this very enlightenment feel. Sure. But also the reverse part, that the appropriate emotional state uh, facilitates learning. Uh, yeah, and I think you touched on that, in right. addition to context, um, but probably haven't had a chance to expound on or discuss in great details. And now, I'm going to be more specific because I think we probably can spend another hour talking about this because you obviously thought about these things. And I think this image of guru right. speaking to the, it's actually this much to it in the emotional part in addition to social and context. But I'll be very specific actually, it's kind of shifting away AI. And I love your comment that yes, AI is wonderful, uh, but people will still learn the way they do. And I don't think AI will change their neural circuitry unless we'll uh, you know, implement Elon Musk's uh, little chip for one day and <laughs> enhance the circuit, but it's really far away. So just sure. not think about it. My specific question. When we talk about creative people or emotional response to something, you know, you go around, go outside, stop a random person and ask, you know, can you think about an engineer that Maybe that's how it generates this uh, extremely positive emotional response. And no one would say that. But you say, who, who will you think about it? Typically, people would say an artist, right? Art is associated with creativity aspect, emotional response, both the art, the performance of it and appreciation of it. Do you think that art should play a role in the way we teach engineering to promote this emotional state? And how? Sure, uh, exactly. The, the last, uh, the, the Sanskrit sloka was actually in the context of learning Bharatanatya, the Indian classical dance, where it says that you need to have that focus, that goes to mind, will do that. Okay. So art has more emotion than uh, general this thing, but creating that part of it, uh, the um, part of it as part of your every course, uh, sometimes may be difficult. You can't do that. Every, every course may not bring that emotion. Uh, which is the easy probably because of this a cat based course where they can see what they're making by end of it they can have affinity they can connect themselves to that in all courses it may not be possible and with the curriculum we have such a packed curriculum sometimes it's even difficult to have instructor to you go beyond what they can do to connect the dots for them to appreciate these aspects of it what can we one thing we can do is at least they should have uh, one of the things i recently yesterday i was listening to one of the talks in in the Colorado School of Mines, they have certain minors where student, uh, the curriculum can bring those things together to them. Say, who is who's the responsibility to connect the dots? In the, in, the, in the Gurukul concept, I was talking, a guru is the only person, he does everything, so there's no decompartment list of knowledge. It is happening in the context of an, a, in, a, in a social environment, so there is no decontextualization. So learning is, everything is, includes everything happening within there. Now, because of the compartmentalization, I don't know. I may learn some ethics. I may learn some art in some other class, but I don't know how to integrate in uh, in statics. I mean, of course, it's difficult in particularly the examples I have taken, but they should have some minors uh, in the 21st century uh, Georgia Tech thing. Can students can choose from, hey, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Combine them together and see that is the, the level of thing where they can they can feel that emotion that time when in the classroom, it's difficult. It, uh, it has to be at the, uh, at the curriculum level, the changes has to happen, I guess. If I make a quick that comment. Makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. A few years ago, I was involved in something I've heard called STEAM, as opposed to STEM, which was science, right. technology, engineering, yeah. art, and uh, sure. mathematics. Yeah. Uh, 
working with SCAD, as I would call it, or column design. So somehow in, in, integrating art in some way. As you said, yes, it is difficult. Now, for industrial design here is there to some extent to, to bring about, but it, it's, it's more challenging. I would say this is an institute-wide focus. As you might have seen already, there's a search for vice president for uh, learning in the area of arts. Because one of the uh, strategic plan thing is about integrating arts with our athletics and engineering uh, sciences. So that's that's something which is going to be done. And we have to start thinking in ME how we're going to do it. So that's also another engagement. So, of course. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful yes. talk. I kind of like, you know, these emotions and all the dimensions that you are referring to, I kind of like associate them with creating the conditions where learning experiences happen. So I see the class that you might want to, emotions might be related to learning experience. And I can, I can clearly see that the design class can provide many opportunities for having such experiences. So my question was like, what do you think, how do you think we can create this learning experience in a more rigorous class, statics? And what are the constraints and what are the opportunities there? Yeah, I was briefly touching upon that one. The process-oriented approach is something uh, which is, I mean, it may be too much uh, to talk about it. Uh, for example, uh, I have went to an American Society for Engineering Education conference. Uh, they were talking about a static problem where um, uh, they start with the story, an immigrant um, from so-and-so country is, um, is climbing a 10-story building to clean the windows. Okay. They're creating a static problem from a context there. I mean, it is too much going away from, of course, your static problem doesn't change whether whatever may be the context, the, the, the equations are going to be the same. But you can bring the emotion into that by, by, by decontextualizing it. It can be a problem, as I said, 2 plus 2 equal to 4, 2 candies plus 2 candies. You're immediately bringing the context into that. So to, to what extent you can do that? And if the, I was, uh, uh, the talk I was attending last week was, he had the database of those problems in statics. And he is, they, they call it uh, problem rewrite. You take an engineering textbook problem and rewriting with the social context. Okay, If somebody can do that, I can use the textbook. At least I can use that to bring in some excitement to the classroom. Okay, some It may be, it may be discouraging to some students. Maybe definitely many students may like that in the context of understanding the subject matter with a specific context. Um, and I was arguing in, the, in that uh, ASC conference saying that a machine design is a machine design. Whether you bring a context or not, your maximum stress is not going to decrease or increase, isn't it? So that's not going to change. But that is something you can do that, I guess. Yeah. Probably completely not answered your answer question, but that's my thought mm -hmm. process. Thank you, Raghu. Let's join and give a round of applause. <laughs> you don't have a raise. But as a part of this thing, as a part of this thing, like you're gonna get a check uh, for discretionary fund. And then, on behalf of everyone from the school, we have a plaque for you. So I'm going to pass this to you. So congratulations. Thank you. And I want to also do one thing very quickly. So all the other Ziegler Award, if you can just stand up, we all recognize you also. Thank you to you also for sharing here for 23 years. He <laughs> spent a lot of time here, but he's taking care of 7,000 students. <laughs> Thank you.